The Gospel of Mark depicts Jesus as a superhero, but here at the end, he shows Jesus doing nothing, except protesting his arrest. Then Mark adds a strange detail that the other Gospel writers don't even include. It's very strange. What's going on here? Our story today starts with verse 43, where it says, just as Jesus was speaking. Uh, Jesus had just told Peter, James, and John to wake up because the temple guard had arrived. So he says, let's advance to meet them, Jesus says. So what did Peter, James, and John expect Jesus to do when he advances to meet this guard? Or whatever they thought, Jesus does nothing. Let's listen to the story. It's in Mark 14, 43 to 53. There you'll see what I mean and how strange this is. I'm reading from the New International Version, and I have updated it a bit from things I have read on the commentaries. So starting with verse 43, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared, and with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away safely. Going at once to Jesus, Judas says, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off a piece of his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wrapped in a cloth sheet was following Jesus. And when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving the sheet behind. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law came together. So let's look at this. Who was this crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders? What is Mark indicating with this list? These people were sent from the highest religious ruling body in Israel, the Sanhedrin. And this guard was the temple guard sent by the Sanhedrin. And they came from the temple itself. So Jesus reminds them, Every day I was with you and you didn't arrest me. The temple guards had seen him every day. In fact, at one point, one of the temple guards who had been sent to arrest Jesus in the temple went back to the Sanhedrin and said, No one ever speaks like this man. He tells us truth we've never heard before. And that caused them to accuse him of being a disciple of Jesus. So, why did the Sanhedrin need Judas? Well, because they didn't know where Jesus spent the night with his disciples, and of course Judas did. Judas knew that he spent nights in a certain olive grove in Gethsemane. It may have been owned by another of Jesus' secret disciples. Apparently, Jesus had many secret disciples in Jerusalem. 
but they were afraid of the Sanhedrin who had the authority to prevent them from worshiping God in the temple. And so they didn't want to admit they were disciples of Jesus. So how did Jesus know this guard had arrived? Well, some people think it's from his uh, divine knowledge. Well, maybe. But I think it's really something more ordinary. Commentators say that these olive groves were generally surrounded by uh, a fence, a wall of stone. Now, how did Jesus know the guard had arrived? Well, some commentators think that it was divine knowledge. I think it was something a bit more ordinary. They say that these olive groves were surrounded by walls with a gate, and Jesus apparently had left eight of his disciples down at the gate. So when the guard came, there was a lot of yelling down there, and I expect that Jesus could hear that in the quiet of the night. And so he knew they were on their way. Now, Jesus had prayed three times that the Father would come up with another way for him to save humanity. But apparently, this was the only way. And ancient prophecy had predicted that it would happen this way, through the suffering of the Messiah. And Jesus had, in the end, finally agreed to go through with the plan that he had known it all along and had warned his disciples about this plan. So, from this time on in Mark, Jesus is depicted as completely passive, a superhero who does nothing to defend himself. No. What's with this kiss? Doesn't that seem strange too? Judas immediately walks up to Jesus and gives him a big old smooch and calls him a rabbi. It's a title of respect, his teacher, right? Apparently the normal greeting for men who are good friends, is to kiss one another on the side of the cheeks, or on the forehead, for that matter. But the commentators say this kiss seems to be more than that. It seems to be a kiss of genuine affection, of even love. It's a word that's more intimate. It showed that Jesus was Judah's special friend. And Mark is showing us the incredible irony that Judas is displaying with this kiss. You know, um, I read commentators that try to say that Judas is not necessarily the bad guy here. But the other gospel writers certainly thought he was. If the gospel of Mark is in fact the memoirs of Peter, we know that Peter knows what Jesus can do. He probably expected him to destroy this guard. What he didn't expect is that Jesus would do nothing. So, apparently someone felt they had to defend him. Mark doesn't say who wielded the sword or why, it might have been that that person was still alive at the time that Mark was writing, and it would be dangerous for him to be identified. Well, he seems to have come prepared to fight because that sword was as sharp as a razor. But he was obviously not a trained swordsman because he seems to have totally missed his target. The word that Mark uses here is translated ear, but it's actually a diminutive of that noun, and so it would mean a piece of his ear. So the swordsman cut off a piece of the guy's ear. 
Mark doesn't say that Jesus healed them. He doesn't do anything. Well, he does protest his arrest, but that's all. He says the scriptures must be fulfilled, but we're not sure what scriptures he's talking about. And the scriptures that are very relevant seem to speak more of his upcoming passion, Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Jesus has told the temple guards that what you in fact have done is fulfill the prophecies. I wonder what they thought of that. There is one that seems to be more appropriate. It's Zechariah 13, 7. It says, my sword, wake up, attack my shepherd, attack the man who is close to me, announces the Lord who rules over all. Strike the shepherd down, and the sheep will be scattered. Well, since Jesus is doing nothing to defend himself, someone decides they need to defend him. But he won't allow others to defend him either. He says, put your sword down. So, his disciples scatter. And that's just exactly what that Zechariah passage had predicted would happen. Now Mark adds something very strange. It's about this young man. And the other Gospels don't include it at all. Um, so there's this young man who's wrapped in a cloth sheet. Some translations say linen, but from what I read, there is no word in these languages for linen, so I just called it a cloth. And it was wrapped around him. I mean, it's like, what, a toga or something? Anyway, he runs off and he leaves the sheet in the guard's hands. And he's like, whoa. <laughs> oh, gosh, there's been so much speculation about who this young man is, but of course, nobody knows. It could be that this too was a guy who was still alive at the time Mark was written. That would be a danger to identify him. But some have thought that this is Mark himself, since he was a young man at this time. But in thinking further about it, I know that Mark likes symbolism. We've seen that. He likes the foreshadowing, and we've seen that. So let me ask a leading question. Who else in the story of Jesus' passion is wrapped in a cloth and then goes away, leaving the cloth behind? Now, I have also included the next verse, verse 53, because it shows who this guard came from, gives us an idea of where the story is going. Verse 53 then says, they took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law came together. What he's describing is the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. They're convening to convict Jesus. They've been wanting to kill him since the beginning of Mark, his third chapter, and now they have him. All this took place in the early hours of the morning. It shows how this capture was the scheme of all the members of the Sanhedrin, they were motivated to get up way before sunrise to hold an unlawful trial in the dead of night in the high priest's house and not even in the temple where these things usually take place. Jesus said it was the time when darkness reigns. He knew that he was in a battle with Satan and with his minions then, the Sanhedrin, the religious people. Well, 
dark side. Okay, well, that's the story. Is there anything in this story we can take home for ourselves? Well, Christians are called to be meek, you know, like Superman with the glasses, right? But I don't think we understand what that word meek means. It means great strength under great control. It's like having a mammoth stallion under the control of its rider. And that was what Jesus was doing. Jesus never used his power to help himself, and he didn't allow others to do so either. And he said, how else is he going to carry out his father's plan? So, Jesus, Mark's superhero, with his great power, great authority, and according to Matthew, he had the authority to call down 70,000 angels. Jesus does nothing. With the chaos swirling around him, he stands there still. He allows himself to be tied up and marched off. And from here on out, Jesus is alone. Only he knows the big picture, the Father's plan. He tried to tell the disciples, but they didn't hear him. They didn't understand. So they took off. But I think we need to keep in mind when we pray that there really is a big picture going on that we don't know about. That God might be working out in our lives and in the lives of those people we pray for. We may get an answer that's different than what we expect, or we may get no answer at all. Yes, God may seem to be standing still while we're in a swirling chaos. So I think we need to remember this picture of Jesus and let ourselves also stand still, even when we feel like panicking or flailing around with a sword or something. We must remember that God is at work. Well, think of the story of Job in the Old Testament. Even all through Job's suffering, God does nothing at all except to listen in to the conversation between Job and his friends. And then at the end, God reminds Job that he commands the stars and the galaxies and even the earth and the people and all the animals. And God even commands chaos itself. That's what Leviathan and Behemoth meant. Behemoth meant. Like Job, when God seems to do nothing in answer to our earnest prayer, I think we need to be prepared to trust him Anyway, like Job, what Job say? Even if you should kill me, I will trust him. Psalm 46 says that God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. It doesn't say from trouble, notice. It says in trouble presence in trouble. He's there in it with you. Therefore, we do not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the sea, though the waters form and roar, and the mountains quake with their surging. Down to verse 10, he says, be still and know that I am God. 
So although we may not see God acting on our behalf at all, whether we have or we haven't prayed, even when we don't expect him to be doing anything, even if we're asleep, like I recently was, well, last year, I guess, I was asleep when I got a major stroke in my brain and God brought me through it and I had nothing to do with that. No one was praying about it. It was all God and I was asleep. God is at work in our lives and God is God's ways are not our ways, and our ways are not God's ways, and that's the way we would want it, I would think. That's the way we would expect it to be. We can't know everything that's going on in the world. We can't even know what's going on in our own lives that he's given us. So, God remains a mystery. I don't think I'd have it any other way. If God is God, he, he has to remain a mystery. So, a long time ago, I gave my life back to Jesus. And I invite you to do the same thing, if you haven't done already. Why? Why would you give your life to Jesus, even if he doesn't do anything? Well, it's because he loves you. And he's, his standing still demonstrates his love for you and me, because it was the beginning of how he came to save us on the cross and his resurrection. So, be calm and stand still, my friends. Amen.